Alright, today is Tuesday, December 28th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but let's start with this. What happened to Santa? All of a sudden, Santa's not in town. Not in Wall Street, at least. And rumor has it, Santa caught the Pokemon variant and hairpiece. So I guess Santa has to quarantine for a little while. But you know where Santa did not show up for good? It is the crypto market, aka the tulip market. What a beating. Oof. And here's the real problem, folks. Some of you went to visit family during Christmas and you told grandpa, look at all the gains that I made, grandpa. Made a lot of money. I bought you a new tie. And grandpa's like, well, 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 are, are you selling drugs? No, 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 grandpa. I'm just trading tulips. You know, Doge, Shiba, Cub Rocket. Look at all the gains, grandpa. You're missing out, bro. And guess what? Poor grandpa. He bought the dip in tulips. He bought BTC, Bitcoin. And now he's down about, what, 7%? The good news is he did not use his retirement money. He used your inheritance money. And you know, the signs were already out there when you have uh, former rock stars like... <laughs> husband. When they start to pump tulips, NFTs and garbage that doesn't even exist, it is probably time to go home. Take your profits, go home. You have Gene Simmons all in pumping tulips 24 hours, 7 days a week. You have Ozzy Osbourne now pumping tulips. You know what? I trust these uh, musicians for music and dope only. No tulips. You know what else is bad? It's the freak show going on in airports right now. Flight cancellation, the tsunami of cancellations. You thought Snakes on a Plane was a bad movie? Think again. And what about the horror show at cruises? Well, they're being docked, cases all over the place, people not allowed to leave, and the CDC wants to investigate all of these cruises. And on top of that, some of your beloved politicians, they did not receive a Christmas gift from the cruise industry. And now they're calling for halting all cruise operations. And I say, you know what? Wire this guy 500 bucks and he'll shut up right away. And this is all due to the Pokemon variant and your beloved and trusted medical experts and advisors. Well, they're now reversing stance because the cooking did not go so well. In the beginning, they said about 75% of cases are all due to the Pokemon variant. Well, now they're saying make that about 59 we messed up the ingredient a little bit. No biggie here. And now your beloved and endeared medical experts are saying, you know what? You gotta cancel those New Year's Eve parties. That's a no-go. We need more sadness and misery. And specifically in the state of Illinois, Chicago. I mean, you've already been miserable before the Pokemon and before the whole thing started. Because your beloved governor says, do not host New Year's Eve parties. Because uh, uninvited guests will show up. And we're talking about the D. And the Pokemon, they will show up to your party, so make sure that you hide the silverware. But anyhow, folks, we gotta move on here. We got a show to do, and here it is, in focus tonight. Let's talk about the rise and the upcoming fall of retail investors. Have you ever noticed that us retail investors, we don't have the rise and stay up there. It's always rise and fall, boom and bust. 1929, the dot-com bubble, 2009, we always end up holding the bag. And in this bubble, I got a spoiler alert for you. You're gonna hold the bag again. Somebody has to. When you think about it, when you look at the half full part of the glass, you hold those bags, you grow the biceps, right? Strong. But you'll know by the end of the segment why retail investors will end up holding the bag. You see, if you started investing last year, after the marsh bottom, the crash, when you downloaded Robinhood and you started buying call options with a blindfold on, scoring hundreds if not thousands of percentage on weekly and monthly basis, don't really believe that you are an investment genius because you're not. You were just in the right place at the right time because we have the easiest financial conditions in history. What does that mean? It means the Fed has been flowing the market with cocaine, unprecedented amount of cocaine. And whether you're a genius or not, it doesn't matter. You put your blindfolds on, you buy call options, you buy anything, any garbage out there, it's gonna go higher until it doesn't, of course. And it is not a surprise that this year we almost broke in the record. The S&P 500 has closed at a record 68 times this year. Make that 69. Wouldn't that be a nice coincidence, right? 69 times at all-time highs, and then we blow up. And of course, this is the most since 1995. One of the easiest markets in history. And of course, the retail crowd, they want more. 
We want more gains, bro. The moon, Jupiter, Uranus. We want to go higher and higher. And now they're waiting for Santa Claus, right? If Papa Jerome is not available, let's go with Santa. And if Santa not available, we'll find another mystical creature to float us here. And just a reminder, in easier markets, everybody's a genius. All you have to do is buy the dips, buy the most garbage companies, no revenues, no profits. Those are the best. And just call for the market to go higher and higher and higher. Case in point, back in the dot-com bubble, if you remember, we had a blindfolded monkey who beat the S&P 500. In this bubble, we have human apes who managed to beat the S&P 500, at least for now. And of course, they're going all in. Buy the dips, bro. Doesn't matter. Papa Jerome not available. Santa Claus not available. Who cares? The market goes higher. And that's all there is. Stonks only go up. And retail investors poured over $30 billion to buy the dip. And guess what? The market went down anyways. But guess what? Santa came to the rescue and he pushed the market higher again. So you're now right about even. Maybe you're sitting on a little bit of gains here. But that's about it. Santa is about to deliver the bags. He's been naughty this year. And look at this. Record inflow in December. Over $30 billion. Unbelievable. The retail crowd is all in. We're not worried about inflation. We're not worried about fundamentals. We're not worried about China, Russia. All of that doesn't matter. Fed, Jerome Powell, Hawk, doesn't matter. All in, bro. Till the end. And the problem with this market is we are seeing individual stocks being absolutely nuked. Take, for example, Peloton, Roku, Zoom, DocuSign, ARK Invest. All of that garbage is blowing up. And all of a sudden, retail investors are like, whoa, 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 what happened here? I thought we're going to the moon. The only thing that's still going to the moon is the indices, the SPY, the Qs, and the reason is you have the big caps. Look at the contrast here between 2011 and 2021. The big caps, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, form almost 25% of the entire S&P 500. So while we're seeing individual names being blown up, these names have been holding the S&P 500. They will be the last block to fall. If you add NVIDIA to this group, you have almost 25% of the S&P 500. And this is the danger here. The concentration of the S&P 500 waiting in a handful of names. The smaller cap names already got absolutely crushed. The speculative names, the ARK Invest kind of names, absolutely crushed. And after that, they started shooting the mid cap names. And the next step is to blow up the big caps. And after the big caps are blown up, it's over. Hello, bear market for perhaps decades. Yep, we'll get to that in a second. But the retail mania has been so good to corporate America and the rich. Corporate America raised over $12 trillion in 2021 alone. Thank you to the retail investors. Now, they use this money to buy back their stock, pump these stocks higher, the last hurrah ratty, so they can exercise their options and dump these stocks at the top and cash in billions of dollars. And then after the market crashes, they use all of these trillions and billions to buy the dip again, scooping all of these assets at a cheaper price and concentrating the wealth in this country even more than it's already concentrated. And at that point, you and I, the retail geniuses will be gone. We'll be holding the bags and crying. They cheated us. Uh, the stock market is rigged. Yada, yada, yada. And buying the dip is getting a little risky here because we're seeing more massive down days. The back-to-back -back big down days are getting more frequent. And we haven't seen this phenomenon since earlier this year. So the problem here is if you're buying the dip via call options, weekly call options, you're probably going to lose all your money in the long run because these back-to-back -back losses, they're getting more frequent. And here comes the FUD part, folks. So a disclaimer, if you're not into FUD, go ahead and grab your diapers. I'll stop for a second here because here it is. The headline says it is December 1999 based on the NYSE shares touching new lows. Da, da, da. What happened after December 1999, I wonder? Look at your charting program and see what happened. Amid all celebrations of a rousing year end in stocks, Doug Ramsey has a sobering observation about a situation below the market's surface. Last week, when the S&P 500 closed at a 52-week high, 334 companies trading on the New York Stock Exchange hit a 52-week low, more than double the amount that marked new one-year highs. That has happened only three other times in history, all of them in December 1999. And this is according to Ramsey, who's a big shot in some group. 
And it's not just a one week phenomenon. NYSE new lows now also outnumber new highs on a six week moving average basis. The last time that happened as the S&P 500 hit a one year high was in July 2015, right before a six month correction that saw the index lose around 14%. Now go ahead and grab another diaper because you already winned that one because here it is already buying fatigue has crept up in the riskiest corners. Over the past few weeks the Russell 2000 of small caps fell into a 10% correction. Newly minted stocks or minted shares sank into a bear market decline of 20%. A group of profitless profitless technology firms lunged almost 30%. The aggressive buy the dip mentality which proved so profitable for the last one and a half years plus, especially in the high multiple corners of the market, was underwritten by a tidal wave of stimulus that is now receding. Are you paying attention or not? And this is according to Adam Crisafuli, the founder of Vital Knowledge. If that wasn't enough, here comes the whale. And it's a Norwegian whale. You know, Norwegian whales are larger in size. They're big. They're huge. Norway Wealth Fund CEO sees market weakness, inflation threat. What's up with the FUD, bro? The head of Norway's $1.4 trillion wealth fund, this is the largest in the world, by the way, said he expects a lengthy period of weakness in financial markets and warned that inflation could be the most significant challenge ahead. Nikolai Tanjin, the chief executive officer of Norges Bank Investment Management, told Germany's Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Whatever she said. And by the way, I get a little uh, midget German lady who lives under my desk. Just to help me with the pronunciations, of course. Geil. Okay, shut up. Geil. Okay, okay. Anyways, he told the thing that she said that after achieving an average rate of return of 6% for a quarter century, the fund is now preparing for a decade of lower returns, quote unquote, once again, a decade of lower returns. It might even turn negative, quote unquote. This is according to the Norwegian whale. We just have to accept that. The future will be less attractive for us than the past. He also added the biggest potential problem for the fund the world's biggest owner of publicly traded stocks is inflation and predicted surging prices could have far more serious consequences than is currently generally assumed, quote unquote. I see inflation everywhere, in freight rates, in the prices of metals and food, in construction costs, and gradually in wages. As a long-term investor, we don't have that many options, he added. We have nowhere to hide from inflation. And of course, this Norwegian whale fund is the largest in the world, with over 9,000 stocks in their portfolio. So when they talk, we have to listen. But I know, I know. What is this Norwegian whale knows about anyways? We know. We, the Robin Hoodiots, we know what's up. We know Papa Jerome is on our side. He's just bluffing. He's never going to raise interest rates. And therefore, we have to go all in. Call options. Blindfolds on. Heads first. Naruto style. Just like the old days of last year. Options trading activity hits record powered by retail investors, but most are playing a losing game. What does she know, that Yun Li, right? What does she know? What's up with the fund? A record of 39 million options contracts have traded daily, wow, daily on the average this year, rising 35% from 2020. And retail investors now account for more than 25% of this trading activity. However, the majority of these small-time traders are buying the most basic call and put options, which have a much lower probability of profit compared with advanced strategies like option spreads. Everybody in the business knows that if you're only buying out-of-the-money calls, then you are likely going to lose money over time, said some uh, FUD person. What does he know, right? Buy out-of-the-money, weekly expiration, to the moon. And the problem is, you've been buying call options out-of-the-money with weekly expiration on meme stocks. And that worked in the past, but it's not working so far. And you can see the explosion, the mania of options trading. They're not interested in holding stocks. They're not interested in investing. They're not even interested in trading. They're just brainless zombies high on meth looking for the next score. Give us the ticker, bro. Give us the next call options we're supposed to buy out of the money, weekly expiration, for 10 cents a piece. That's going to blow up from 10 cents 
to 10 bucks. This is of course going to end up in a disaster. And here's a piece of advice by the way. If you're going to buy out of the money call options naked, you get a chance of profit of about 25%. However, if you use spreads and you buy closer to the money, your chance of profits moves from 25% to 40%. A little worse than blackjack, but hey, the casino is too far. I like the casino at the tip of my fingers. Robin Hood. But, and this is the big but, perhaps there is a glimpse of hope here that retail investors are getting more disciplined because we're seeing an interesting phenomenon here. Traders turn to derivatives that protect against US market fall. What does that mean? Investors are buying put options in ever greater numbers as they seek to avoid losses after this year's strong equity rally. After you get shot in Peloton, Zoom, RKK, the YOLO stocks, GME, AMC, now they're learning that perhaps you want to buy some put options here for protection. And look at that, put options are surging higher, specifically on individual stocks, not the indices yet. And as you can see, the gap between call and put options volume has started to shrink. And this is not a good sign for the stock market, folks. As you can see, when we get to negative readings, that means that we're yoloing call options. And along with the cook, this strategy has supported the market to go to the stratosphere, to mania territory, vertical rally higher for almost two years now. But look at what's going on here. We're having the saucer bottom, we're moving higher, and that reading is about to pop to positive territory. And when that happened, it comes hand in hand with a crash. All of a sudden, everybody scrambles to buy put options as the crash starts to happen. Investors are increasingly turning to a tool to protect them if the US stock market careens lower in the coming weeks. Traders are buying put option contracts in ever greater numbers, hoping that the derivatives will provide a hedge if stocks fall from record territory. The rising use of put options contracts, including by the swell of new retail day traders who entered the market this year has accompanied a surge of volatility in the 53 trillion dollars u.s equity market now can you imagine what will happen if retail traders start to yolo put options inducing reverse gamma squeezes in the market and crushing the rich and the wall streeters they will ban retail trading like that. They will ban Robin Hood. They will probably take us to jail. But so long as we are the useful imbeciles who are pushing stocks higher by YOLOing and then holding the bag after that, the oligarchs are okay with that. That's totally fine. While the S&P 500 has advanced by more than 27% this year, setting a new record on Monday, those gains have not been evenly distributed and many investors who step in to buy on dips have not been rewarded, aka catching a falling knife. More than 200 of the companies within the US equity benchmark are down at least 10% from the recent highs, with close to 90 of those S&P 500 companies off at least 20%. That has been one signal for some traders that the so-called everything rally is not as durable as many of the benchmark indices have made it appear. The Qs, the S&P, almost at all-time highs, but individual stocks, not so hot so. Customers made a ton of money buying calls and speculating over the past year or two, and now that doesn't work anymore, quote-unquote, said Henry Schwartz, the head of product intelligence at the exchange owner CBOE. He also added, how many customers can successfully shift into strategies that will do well in a sideways or a down market question mark the answer is not so many because the majority of these traders and investors have not seen a bear market yet goldman sachs strategist vishal vivik noted that single stock put options trading hit a record 353 billion dollars on december 3rd and that average daily trading volumes of 233 billion dollars in november was an all-time high Vivek added that the 217 billion daily put options volume, that is the average of course in December, remained elevated despite a decline in single stock call options, quote unquote. There are signs some of that buying is coming from retail traders. Yep, we're buying puts. An increasing number of small sized option trades, options trades, which investors have used as a gauge of retail investor activity have been for those new put contracts. 
Let's YOLO puts. Jason Geopervert of Seaman Trader estimates that roughly 23% of new retail options contracts open in the new week ending December 17th or for puts, up from 16% at the start of November, so we're increasingly buying puts here. But is it really retail traders who are buying the puts? We'll answer that in a second, but it is a flexibility that people don't think retail had, said Peter Van, uh, whatever that is, the hedging specialist at Hedge Fund Man Group. He also added, they think of retail as knee-jerk by the dip called buyers, but we are seeing that sophistication quote-unquote, Van uh, whatever added that it was not simply retail traders turning to the options. Big money managers have also gravitated to put contracts, using them to hedge their portfolios instead of treasuries, giving the view that the U.S. government debt has little room to rally in the event of an equity market drawdown. The number of put contracts outstanding has climbed by more than 25% since the end of 2019, according to data from CBOE Global Markets and Option Metrics. And there is a sense that even new retail traders are not exhibiting some of their old habits. When buying call options, the swarm of free Retail traders often opened and closed option trades on the same day. And this is, of course, in a bid to profit on the price swings of the option, as opposed to making a long-term call on the movement of the underlying stock, aka gambling. That's all there is. While that has been partially true on the put side, strategists and traders said there were signs these small traders were also using the puts, listen to this, in the more traditional sense, holding puts to hedge against the sell-off. And notice while the S&P 500, the Qs, at all-time highs, this this year has been an excellent year for investing if you bought the right stocks. But if you bought 2020 stocks, the YOLO, the mania, not so hot so. This market is killing me, quote unquote. Reddit user called Donkey 4784 wrote on the message board Wall Street Bets. In a discussion about how to make profits, sometimes referred to as chicken tenders, quote unquote, using options trades. The person said, I am a bull by nature, but I am happy to use puts if it makes tendies, quote unquote. But you know, with all of this FUD, this is all garbage, of course. This is a, what do they know, right? What do they know, these put options buyers? What do they know? We, the Robin Hood, it's no. The market only goes up. And I agree. You don't have to listen to the FUD, by the way, because you got the criminals at JP Morgan on your side. JP Morgan says investors are too bearish. No sell-off in sight. Relax, rest assured, put your blindfolds on, run Naruto style, heads first, and continue to buy calls at individual stocks. Meanwhile, JP Morgan clients, you know, the rich, well, apparently, they want to own a little less of the everything bubble in 2022. What does that mean? JP Morgan says, uh, rest assured, continue to buy. And they want you to buy the bags that the rich is about to hand to you. And let's conclude with this. This article from this gentleman, whatever his name is, doesn't matter to me, about the rise and the upcoming fall of retail investing. Retail investors riding the bull market could spur a populist backlash. This is the headline. Arguably, the bull market of 2021 is the same one that started in 2009, with one big change. Retail investors, who sat on the sidelines for so many years, rushed in after the pandemic-induced flash crash last year, have since been buying every dip with mounting enthusiasm. They represent not only a new cohort of investors, but a new voting bloc, increasing the risk of a populist backlash should one of the dips turn into another bear market. Are you saying stocks don't only go up? They lied to me. Remember that policymakers played a big role in starting this craze? Via insider trading, of course. They bought ahead of time, you see. Flush with government support checks and fresh liquidity from central banks, new investors began pouring a part or part of their income into markets, helping to turbocharge the bull run into a 13th year. More than 15 million Americans downloaded trading apps during the pandemic, and surveys show many of them are young, first-time buyers. Retail investors have also been hyperactive in Europe, doubling their share of daily trading volume and in emerging markets from India to the Philippines. All told, U.S. investors alone poured more than $1 trillion into equities worldwide in 2021. Uh-oh. Three times the previous record and more than the prior 20 years combined. 
after retreating last decade, and they retreated for a good reason, by the way. They've been holding the bag from the dot-com bubble and the 09 crash. U.S. households overtook corporations as the main contributors to net demand for equities in 2020. They now own 12 times more stock than hedge funds. Whoops. Media coverage tends to peak at the zaniest moments such as when the Robin Hood crowd was going gaga for GameStop and the other meme stocks last winter. But the craze never slowed. Retail investors' quote-unquote interest measured by internet searches for popular market news and trading outlets has continued to climb skyward. U.S. households bought an astonishing pace throughout 2021, peaking in the third quarter when their stock holdings rose by more than 16% over the previous year. That level of new retail flows matches the prior record set in 1963. Google what happened after that. Anyways, Alas, going back to the crash of 1929, one common feature of bull markets is that retail investors catch on too late. Yep, today they continue to buy even as corporate insiders are selling in record amounts. The rich dumps, the poor buys, with insider sales topping $60 billion this year. And insiders have the opposite record. They tend to sell at the peak. Duh. Should the market turn sharply, the fact that high-profile CEOs move to reduce the risks in time will only serve to encourage outrage among smaller investors who did not. And on top of that, remember this, the Fed also caught insider trading and they dumped almost at the top. Oh boy. Instead of counseling caution, however, Democrats and Republicans in a rare bipartisan show of unity have cheered the quote-unquote democratization of markets and defended the right of Americans to speculate freely on meme stocks, even if it seems irrational. These sons of bitches are rubbing their hands, licking their chops, waiting for you to hold the bag. If you make them richer, if they can use insider trading, insider information, to also YOLO call options and profit on your dime, and then dump at the top and leave you holding the bag, why not? Of course we have bipartisan show of unity. But here's where it gets more dangerous. Another warning sign of impending trouble for the markets is heavy borrowing to buy stocks or margin debt. Net margin debt in the U.S. now amounts to 2% of GDP, a high since record began three decades ago. Are you paying attention or not? This will be the biggest crash in history. A large chunk of it is on the tab of retail investors, their borrowing to buy stocks rose by more than 50% over the past year to record levels, much as it did before the crashes of 2001 and 2008. But many retail investors are placing their bets in a highly speculative way, for example, by buying one-day call options or stocks with low nominal value that are easy to lever up. It is a surreal sign of confusing times to hear avowedly socialist political leaders defend extreme capitalist risk-taking by a class of investors that includes many lower and middle-income voters. You know why? Because there is no Republican Party, there is no Democrats Party, there are no progressives, they're all the same criminals. They work for the same team, the 1%, the oligarchs class. That's all there is. The result is a market that is historically overvalued, overowned, and to a perhaps unprecedented extent, politically flammable. Americans now have an unusually high level of savings, and the share of their portfolios that they hold in stocks now matches the all-time high, going back to 1950. Now, here's a note to all of these Wall Street uh, financial media writers. When you write something, have the confidence in your call, because they write all of this FUD, all of these facts, by the way, they're not just FUD, these are facts. And then at the end, they retreat, and they write the but, 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 but paragraph. You just wrote a whole column, and you contradicted yourself at the end. Why? Because you're scared. You're scared of being wrong. You're not bold. You're afraid of calling things, and then you turn out to be wrong because the main extended for a few more weeks or a few more months. Have some confidence for the love of God. And here it is, none of this necessarily pretends an imminent crash. There is still plenty of liquidity sloshing around the system, and even some of the most sophisticated investors fret. There is no alternative to owning stocks with interest rates so low. We've heard this garbage for a long time, by the way. I will show you articles 
from 1999 and 2000, right before the crash. They said, but, 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 buy the dip because the cash on the sidelines. And guess what happened after that? The cash on the sidelines is important, but it's not as important as the cash in the game. And when that cash comes out, it's a tsunami that dwarfs whatever cash on the sidelines. Anyways, but having done so much to inspire this retail investor mania, governments and central banks could face a major backlash with the next bear market inevitably arrives. Now let me fix this pussy paragraph for you. And I actually shouldn't say pussy because the three ladies who are watching the show, they're gonna get offended. What's up with the sexism, bro, right? Pussies are strong and durable and they take the beating and uh, pop babies and do other magic tricks. I get it. Let's use another organ, a little above the waist, perhaps. How about eyeballs? They're sensitive, right? Let's remove the eyeball aspect of this uh, paragraph. Here we go. And folks, the bottom line is, the level of arrogance and overconfidence by retail investors is unprecedented. I've never seen this kind of overconfidence in my life. Just read the comments once in a while in this channel. Powell is not going to taper. Powell would never raise interest rates. Markets only go up. You got to continue to buy the dips. Yada, yada, yada. And then when they catch a falling knife and the whole house crashes on the little heads, they're going to come out and say the system is rigged. The markets are manipulated. JP Morgan cheated us. The hedgies. Jerome Powell stabbed us in the back. We already told you that this will happen, but you didn't listen. So we have nobody else but yourself to blame here. Greed is not good. And with that out of the way, let's start the markets coverage, starting with the performance today. And here we go. We have some divergences today because the Dow was up 95.83 points or a gain of 0.26%. On the other hand, the Nasdaq was down 89.54 points or a decline of 0.56%. The S&P 500 was also down by 4.84 points or a decline of 0.10%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, utilities at number two for the silver, defensives. Number three for the bronze, REITs, and the laggards of the day led by technology, communication services, and healthcare. Obviously a defensive theme in the market today. What about the advanced to decline ratios? NYSE 52% advancing versus 50, excuse me, 45% declining. The Nasdaq 36% advancing versus 61% declining. Awful breadth in the Nasdaq. And it has been that way for a long time, by the way. This is a leading indicator that it's just a matter of time before the big caps start to fall apart. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? We have modest rallies here in crude oil prices, WTI up about half a percentage point, Brent exactly half a percent, gasoline prices, heating oil prices were also up, on the other hand natural gas prices traded down almost 2% today. We continue to follow on the tensions between the US and Russia and natural gas prices and so far gas tankers have been rerouting from Asian destinations to European destinations to take advantage of the arbitrage in prices. Natural gas prices in Asia markets are below, well below I should say, European gas prices. But we have to keep in mind that we have record freeze in the Pacific Northwest in this country, my former hometown, and record snowfall in California, yep. So again, these heating oil and gasoline prices will continue to go higher if temperatures continue to drop in other territories in the country. By the way, we have another storm that's about to hit the south around New Year's Eve. What about softs? What's going on here? Lumber futures are exploding higher by almost 8% today alone. This is concerning, folks, because inflation is obviously not transitory. But if they celebrate a drop in the CPI in December due to the dip in energy prices, watch out because energy prices are reinflating again, just as lumber did. We have some modest gains here for cocoa futures, almost 1% to the upside. Meanwhile, we have losses led by cotton, sugar, coffee, and OJ. What about metals? No notable moves here besides palladium moving higher by about 2% and copper losing some of the gains from yesterday. But when we talk about gold and silver, pretty much on the flat line because the dollar is not moving either. What about meats? Live cattle futures on the flat line while we have some gains here for feeder cattle futures and losses of almost 1% for lean hogs. What about grains? Muted activities for soybeans across the board, yet we have gains for canola and rough rice futures. On the other hand, losses, big ones for oats, followed by wheat and corn futures.
Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? Leading the pack, the hottest table by far, per usual, is Apple, with a little over 1.2 million contracts traded today, about 70 2% of those were calls. Tesla, the souffle, number two, with a little over 600,000 contracts. About 61% of those were calls. And at number three, NVIDIA, with almost half a million contracts traded today. About 69% of those were calls. The action remains heavily tilted toward calls. And these are, of course, weekly calls. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market today? Starting with the ticker SPY for the S&P 500. They're buying puts here, the 300. 375 puts for the expiration date February 4th, with the expectations that the SPY will drop down by more than 21.5% by then. This is in all likelihood, by the way, an insurance trade. Somebody's hedging by buying puts on the SPY. But anyhow, they paid about 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about 650 thousand dollars what about the ticker pton peloton what a disaster this stock is probably going to zero they continue to buy puts here adding more pain to the misery in this case buying the 33 puts for the expiration date january 21st with the expectations the peloton could drop down by more than six and a half percent by then they paid about two bucks a piece to enter the trade all in all spending about 1.7 million dollars and what about the ticker bbio and this is for Brent Edge Biopharma. The name is down almost, what, 90% year to date? But today we saw a pop, perhaps some profit taking by shorts, some tax planning, and somebody's bidding that we have more gains to come here by buying the 15 bucks calls for the expiration date January 21st with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 14.5% by then. They paid about one buck and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $700,000. What about the trade for the ticker T? Triple Qs. This is the leverage index for the NASDAQ of the Triple Qs. They're buying puts here. Really interesting. The 160 puts for the expiration date, January 7th. With expectations that the name could drop down by more than 7% by then, and they paid about 2 bucks and 15 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1 million. At the bottom of the table, what about the ticker QQQ? No leverage here. The regular triple Qs. They're also buying puts, betting for a pullback. The 366 books, puts for the expiration date, February 18th with the expectations that the queues could go down by more than 9% by then. They paid about 4 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $2 million. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the ticker MRNA Moderna? They continue to pile in here, more pain for Moderna by buying the 215 puts for the expiration date January 21st. With the expectations that Moderna could go down by more than 11% by then, they paid oh, about 8 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about three million dollars and lastly at the bottom of the table what about the ticker amat amat for applied materials they're buying calls the 170 calls for the expiration date february 18th with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than six percent by then they paid about five bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 1.8 million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here obviously lots of pain lots of selling and profit taking in the technology sector of the market and the losers once again the chinese stocks the zooms and Peloton of the world, the RKK, even some of the winners, the pandemic-related winners, Pfizer and Moderna, also being beaten down, along with the diagnostics like Thermo Fisher, TMO, Abbott Laboratories also down. And what's working today? Value, the likes of IBM, for example, Dell, Disney, these are the names that are working along with the defensives. We're talking about some industrials here, materials, utilities, REITs, and consumer defensives. And of course, part of defensives is the old-school big pharma names forget about pfizer for now this is going to move up and down based on the variant news but we're talking about johnson and johnson merck abvi bristol myers these are continuing to work along with the healthcare providers, health insurance names, the likes of United Health. I am moving on to the charts analysis, starting with SPY, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We're seeing some consolidation here. The market gapped higher in the morning. It sold off midday. We had some uh, selling program. But again, the path of least resistance under high volume is higher. And therefore, we did not see a follow-up after the program took place. The chart is also working out some of these overbought conditions 
on certain charts, but there is more work to be done. And the question is, is what we're seeing right now a series of bull flags followed by a bear flag top in formation that remains to be seen it is a weaker formation because the volume is down and we did not see a follow-up after the program took place the support for now remains 470 the resistance the sky is the limit because the chart is already at all-time highs here is a daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. What's going on here? It is still trading above the bull to bear advantage line, which happens to be 4,657, which means that the bulls still have the advantage here. The momentum indicators are strengthening, but look at that pop higher, vertical line higher, massive rally with little to show in the RSI and the MACD indicators. And the, and the reason is the volume was absent. The volume is coming back slightly today to the downside. So the bears have a point here, although a weaker point yet because we don't have a confirmation. The candle is bad. You can call it a shooting star, reverse hammer, doesn't matter to me. It is a bearish candle. The problem is, absent of confirmation, you could eat another pie in the face and they can gap the market higher again because we are still in the seasonality, the low volume seasonality. We're waiting for a confirmation and another day for sell-off before we say the bears are gaining advantage here. Moving on to the Q's 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? A little weaker than the SPY, but the good news is some of the overboard conditions on the RSI and certain charts are being worked out. We still have more work to do. And the question remains the same. Are we seeing a top in formation here? A bear flag formation? Could be. It is a weak one. We have yet to have a confirmation. If we have a confirmation, then we have the next support at 397. An important line. A very important support slash resistance level. It acts as a magnet. To pull the chart down or pull it up it is the center of gravity in this chart and rest assured before you know it you're gonna see a reading of 397 on the queues once again here's a daily chart for the continuous contract in the queues what's going on here the volume is recovering higher on the selling side this is a bad sign for the bulls and a point to the bears the problem is the bulls still have the advantage the seasonality and they're trading above the sloping line of resistance now support the momentum indicators are strengthening they have reversed the negative divergence and therefore the bears are gaining a slim advantage here of course we're all awaiting the retest of that descending sloping line of resistance now support if we bounce from that line assuming we have a sell-off tomorrow then this is a good sign for the bulls if we pierce below that line there will be a good sign for the bears and here's a chart for the iwm what's going on here we were trading above 223 in a bull Black formation. Today we saw the pop higher, but an immediate reversal right away. And now we have a formation of a bear flag, indicating that perhaps 223 will be retested as support. If it fails, we're looking down at 218. Moving on to the Dixie, what's going on here in the dollar index? No update whatsoever. We still have negative divergences on the momentum indicators, the RSI and the MACD. 96 remains support, so no update for now. And what about gold? What's going on here? Not a good looking candle because gold traded higher and then closed at the lows of the day now the micro outlook remains bullish for gold because we have a bull flag pattern we have momentum indicators that are strengthening for now and we are eyeing the next Fibonacci resistance at around 1835 but the macro outlook for this pattern at least it could be a bear flag formation and if that happens then gold will pull back and retest 1,763 for support. I would rather see that, and if that line is confirmed for support once again, that will be a strong buy signal for gold. And I'm betting that gold will be one of the best ideas for 2022. Here's a chart for the 10-year yield. What's going on here? Perhaps that explains the pullback in gold. Because gold has two enemies. Number one, the dollar, which did not do anything at all today. Number two, the 10-year yield. The 10-year yield moved higher today. And the question is, is what we're seeing right now a bull flag formation gathering energy after a higher low to pop above 1.5% for good? That certainly appears to be the case. Here's a weekly chart for the TLT. What's going on here? It is moving down below 149, not decisively, but the keyword is yet. We're waiting the weekly confirmation, the weekly closing. But even if that happens, it is a low volume shortened trading week, even in the bond market. I shouldn't say shortened actually, because we're still trading on Friday, but it is low volume. We had some auctions throughout the week, but the volume remains low. So we'll take whatever moves we have this week with a grain of salt. And here's a four hours chart for the VIX. What's going on here? It appeared midday that the VIX 
is bottoming and it's starting to move higher. When we look at the MACD indicator, there is an imminent crossing the positive territory, creating green impressions on the histogram. And if that happens, sooner or later, the MACD will cross above zero and that will induce another rally in the VIX. The problem is the closing candle for the day was bad. It appears as a bear flag pattern. So we'll watch the VIX closely tomorrow. And of course, the important closing is the weekly closing. Will the VIX close above 20 or below it? Above 20, a good sign for the bears. Below 20 would be a good sign for the bulls. And here's a daily chart for Apple. What's going on here? It is stopping pretty much at the same target that we have identified before, the sloping line of resistance. It peaked a little above, but now it is facing that resistance. And look at the volume, picking up higher, on the selling side, the momentum indicators remain strong but elevated. They need a pullback. We know the sentiment and the drive behind buying call options in Apple and pushing the stock higher. They want to see the headline of $3 trillion, like a bunch of babies. The problem is, if we get that headline, it will be a strong sell signal. Why? It has been a reliable pattern when Apple hit $1 trillion in 2018. Right after that, that was the top. And not just Apple, but the entire market went down with it. In a steep correction. Likewise, when we got the $2 trillion headline, Apple went down in a steep correction along with the rest of the market. Are we going to get the $3 trillion headline and then that will be the trigger for the upcoming correction? We'll see. What about Tesla daily chart for the souffle? Not a good closing candle here, but still the bulls are in the driver's seat for now until and unless we have a reversal candle. What is a reversal candle you have to reverse at least one day worth of activities that is yet to happen but i want to illustrate the importance of these numbers specifically 1090 and a half when we zoom in to a 30 minutes chart you can see that 995 worked out as resistance and then as support very important line likewise 1090 and a half also worked as resistance and then support again another important line the algos are respecting these lines is what we're seeing right now a formation of of a bear flag if that is the case then tesla will start to pull back starting tomorrow 1090 and a half remains an important line you can round that down to 1090 doesn't matter to me but if you see tesla trading below that number then you know the bear flag is playing out and perhaps we will go down all the way to revisit 995 and here it is moving on to tulips btc bitcoin what's going on here what a disappointment we had the bull flag pattern we had one bullish formation after the other the saucer bottom followed by a bull flag the problem is the technicals are just one component of what moves equities or any asset you still have the mechanics and the fundamentals of course the majority of the selling happened by agent traders and investors so now we can comfortably remove the bull flag and what are we looking at here if the saucer bottoming formation is breached then we're looking back at 42,000 for support notice that the selling came at higher volume so we have a confirmation here that the bearishness is strong the action that we saw today is confirming what does that mean higher volume it confirms the move. The move higher came on lower volume. When you compare a move higher on lower volume versus a move down on higher volume, which one is the strongest? The answer is the move to the downside. And of course, I'm glad that I closed my Coinbase calls yesterday. That was the right call because Coinbase flushed down today along with other crypto related equities. The trade is still profitable because we got in early. The problem is, look at this. These are the options, the call options with the weekly expiration date for Coinbase. I had the 265. This particular call was down over 70% today. Even if the trade remains profitable, it doesn't feel good after losing 70% from yesterday's gains. So the lesson is greed is not good. If you're holding calls or puts closer to expiration and you're up, the trade is profitable, take the profits. You can always, always buy back these calls if you like them and roll out, meaning you buy a longer expiration date. The problem is you cannot get your profits back. If you're down 70% from yesterday, you cannot get these profits back. But if you book the profits and the stock goes down, therefore the options, the call options also go down. You can always buy these options again at a discount, of course, if you still like them. And lastly, what about AMC? Yes, the name was down big today, but again, trading within range. 
the support 26, the resistance 32. So long as 26 is kept as support, there is still hope that AMC could move higher. Losing 26, closing the week below 26, be a really ominous signal for the apes. The daily formations that we talked about yesterday, the reverse head and shoulder, and perhaps the bull flag are still intact, but the move has to happen before the end of the week, because when you look at the weekly charts, the bear flag is still there. If the bear flag remains there, it's gonna play out, folks. You're gonna see a massive leg down in AMC. And lastly, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Not a lot. We have pending home sales index. Today, we got the case home chiller index. And again, home prices are up double digits year over year, but the rate of growth month over month slowed down slightly. So this will be an important indicator for the housing market, the pending home sales index. And with that, folks, we're done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.